Good morning. Wake up, everyone, including Curtis. I, I uh, want to thank Matt and Lindsay for everything they do, and of course, Miss Amy back in the back. One of the things that takes all of us, so I especially want to thank all of you who uh, supported the youth with your finances first and foremost. Uh, the church came forward, the men came forward first, and and uh, it's just amazing that we're able to provide these types of camps. That's a form of mission. We're in a, a sermon series right now on missions, the importance of missions, so thank you. Also, those of you who gave up your time and took those weeks off for that week weekend off. So important. We can't do it without you. And, and I just praise God that the mission of God is on your heart, because what we're going to find out today is simply this, church, that, that missions is not something we do. It's something we are. This, that's really the way it's set up through government. Most of us don't like to hear government. I, I heard something about the, the word uh, pro or the prefix pro actually means um, for, and it, it means good. So if you're a progressive person, you are, are good in the fact that you're moving forward and that con is the, is actually the opposite of that. And so, um, like congressman, uh, <laughs> God, that was bad. I heard a congressman got up the other day and, uh, he was, he was walking around the White House and somebody held him up with a gun at gunpoint and he said, give me all your money. And the congressman replied, look, don't you know who I am that I'm a congressman? And the robber then replied, in that case, give me all my money. <laughs> you know, we're talking about government today because the truth is God's government is really supposed to be upon his church. We are not the church apart from God and his governance over his people. A king must have a kingdom. And so today, the, this important message about the mission of God and how he operates his kingdom, he operates his kingdom, his mission throughout the world because he governs us. He does. And to understand mission, understand mission and the mission of God and your mission on this earth with the time that you have, we've got to understand the government of God. Most are looking for a democratic government. Most of us want to have a vote in what God says we should do or shouldn't do. Most of us want to say, well, we're going to interpret it differently. Most of us don't want, I shouldn't say most, but many of us don't want to listen to God's constitution. What would that be? It would be his holy scriptures. He's a holy God and the only true governance, the only true form of holy governance is being governed by our God because his intentions are pure towards us. Now, I don't know where you are today. You may think, well, what about the United States government? Well, let me just ask you, are the politicians in our United States government today for you? Some of you may say yes, some of you may say no. But man's govern governance will never, will never be holy as God's governance is towards us. And so mission is to understand this. Most are looking, like I said, for that vote, and we even want to vote on God's will for our lives or God's will for his church and for his form of governance here on this earth during our time. Lord, I just want to vote. It's not unusual. We come across that many times in, in church because we're not looking for theocratic government, theos meaning God's government. We're looking for democratic government. That's not how God operates. And when we find ourselves being, being under God's governance, it always puts us on mission, not because it's something more to do. It's because it's who we are. It's simply who we are. Why are we feeding the homeless today? Because it's who we are. It's who Shelly is. It's, it's what she wants to do. It's what she's called to do. But it's also just simply who we are. Why do we go over to Africa? Why do we want to plant churches in Africa when it seems like we're struggling to get in a building on 45th? You're going to hear the reason. Because it's God's governance. It's about setting up his kingdom on this earth. So if you will, please, in Genesis Chapter 1 and 2, we're going to back it up. We're going to go through some biblical chronology all the way back 6,000 years ago, and we're going to look at God's governance. Now, you probably know the story God creates world. He creates man, Genesis 1 and 2. He commands man to cultivate and keep the garden. Keep means to produce. To, to protect. And so cultivate means to keep it pure. So man had a responsibility under God's government governance. 
and, and, and under God's government. I'll say it that way. And so if you'd please stand for the reading of the word this morning, it comes to us first from Genesis 1, 27, and I want you to see God's governance here. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, very quickly, under God's government, right off the bat, we do not have gender dysphoria. There is only male or female, and he saw that that is good. And so it's simple for us because what we have the opportunity to say is simply this. In our government... God has made just the XX and the XY chromosome. Here it is. And so then he goes on to say this. God bless them. He said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and the birds in the sky and the, all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. You may be seated. So right in the beginning of Scripture, we see a couple of things. One is God's government upon the earth. A couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to sit down with a man that I did not know, and he let me know that he was a professor at a university, um, was a local politician and had been for over 20-something years, and he began to speak to me about the United States government. And as he spoke to me, I kind of spoke into what he was saying, speaking about biblical government. And he said, let me tell you something about your God. One is you need to separate your God from local, civil, or any other types of governments that are out there. There is a separation between church and state. And so your form of government under your belief in what you feel is right, should be separated from what we experience in the United States government, however that's been set up. I said, do you know how it was set up? Have you ever <laughs> been to Washington? Ha have you ever seen the scriptures that are engraved? Have you ever read George Washington's uh, prayer journal? Oh, well, he had slaves. Well, I don't like that either. Oh, yeah, well, what, what do you say to the Native Americans who were here before any Europeans came over? And you know, my response to him was the same one I had at Divinity School when I had to read all the books. I said, you had an industrial, close to an industrial revolution happening in Europe, and you had people honing arrowheads here in what we consider today the United States, North America, out of Flint. I don't like that. They fought with one another. They warred against one another. I read about the Cherokees, the Choctaws. I, I love history books, but the truth is they fought with one another. They never won a nation, and someone came and took the nation. Is God in any of this, or is truly God's government separate from anything we do, from anything we feel, from anything we experience here on this earth? Absolutely not. What we see from the very beginning, church, in Genesis chapter 1, what we just read is God chose to work, to allow man to work with him in his government. Subdue the earth. Fill the earth. That, that, that God looked right from the very beginning to include us. Now, a government must have a couple of things. Here's a couple of things that a government must have. First, a ruler, a king. And here it is with God, his command, his kingdom, and his purpose. The second thing it must have is a cabinet or government, what we would say a representative, what the Apostle Paul would call an ambassador. Those who believe in God that listen to his kingdom, plan, and purpose for their lives and for his kingdom's sake. And God began the earth with a kingdom government. What does this have to do with missions? Listen, church, you got to stay with me. A serpent enters in onto the scene. If, if nothing else, surely you've read Genesis chapter 1 and 2. If you haven't, that's your assignment for the week. Go on into 3 and you'll see the serpent. And he enters into the, onto the scene. He offers something different than God's kingdom. He basically looks to, at the very least, divide the kingdom that God has created. 
Then notice what he says. Did God really say that if you eat of this, you shall surely die? Don't you know that you will be like God, knowing both good and evil? In other words, you could be like God. You could rule. You could have your kingdom. You could have your government. Have you ever wondered why the first commandment is the first commandment? Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Because it is a challenge for us to keep our opinion or surrender our opinion, our will, and our ways to our God. It's difficult. And it was difficult for them. And sin enters into the garden. There was a perfect government, a holy government, a perfect kingdom, a perfect ruler or king with perfect intentions towards his people, a God who desired his people to rule with him and not against him. That's how it was originally set up. What does this have to do with missions? I don't know. I'm still getting there. Stay with me. But you will notice this about successful nations, that they always have a mission in front of them. They are not all the same mission, but if it is established, it has a rule, and the rule accomplishes the mission. So what we have today is an attempt, no doubt, a coup, if you will, to change the American government simply, and this you're sitting there going, Curtis, don't get political. No, I'm trying to help you relate to something that we're going to see in God's kingdom and his mission for us. But, but what we see today is, is an attempt to simply say the Constitution is antiquated, it's too old, we, we, we're no longer, we, we need to make some more amendments, if you will. And the church, in many ways, is doing the same thing with the Holy Scriptures. we got to change them, we got to amend them, it's antiquated, it's old. Now, here's the thing. God chose to work with humanity through governments. He chose to work with Adam and Eve. They did well until they looked at their own form of government. Have you ever wondered why the Israelites were the chosen people of God? What caused them to be the chosen people of God? What we find is they were under an oppressive government, the Egyptian government. And because they were oppressed, they cried out to God for what? Freedom. And God shows up. And he says, I've heard the cry of my people. They cried out to him for a different form of government. They did well for a time. There was a time, of course, when Moses comes down and he has the Ten Commandments. Now you have a rule. Before that, the relationship with God was enough. But now we've got to have some rules. And the number one rule is thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Keep God, keep the king on the throne of his kingdom. You see, eventually they lose focus on what their mission truly is, to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus would remind us of those things 4,000 years later. But they would lose focus, and the Babylonians would come in, and they would take over. And then Ezra and Nehemiah would, would call together the people of God, and they would go back to rebuild the wall and to rebuild Jerusalem. To, well, not Jerusalem, but to rebuild the temple. And when they were called back to rebuild the temple, what does the temple represent? It represents God's government on the earth. The way that God had designed. And then, of course... The Medo Persians came in, and you have the Grecian culture that comes in, and then you have Rome ultimately, and then you have John the Baptist, who 400 years after the, prof after the last prophet had said something, Malachi, John the Baptist burst on the scene and he goes, um, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And across the river from him is Jesus. And Jesus reminds us in Matthew chapter 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began preaching and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is no longer out there. It's no longer up there, but it's right here at hand. Now, who are the subjects of the kingdom? Those who would believe. It's still that way today, church. Here's what we know. The prophets of old always pointed to a Messiah to come. A king and a kingdom. They knew the first century would bring on the Messiah. When you study what the prophets were speaking of and when they were speaking of these things, there was an expectation that Jesus, the Messiah, would show up during his time. 
this first century. Remember Isaiah, 700 years prior to Jesus walking this earth, said that there is one to come, one to be born of a virgin, and the government, Isaiah 9, 6, will rest upon his shoulders. A government that rests upon Jesus' shoulders. You see, the Romans were in charge when Jesus showed up on earth. Now, you may ask the question, why the Romans? And another question you could ask, did Jesus work through the Romans? Did, did he pay attention to their government? Well, he did say some things like render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. At that time, it would be Caesar Tiberius. He's number two of the 12 Caesars or two of the 10, depending upon which book you read. But, but here he is, and he's in the midst of another kingdom. He shows up. And it's amazing to me that God shows up during this time. The Jews had their own rules. They, in some ways, had their own kingdom within a kingdom, but they were praying similar to the Israelites. They were looking for God's kingdom to come and overtake and overthrow the Roman government and for them to be put in charge, for them to rule and to reign. And that's not how Jesus came. His government looked very different. Now, Rome in this kingdom, there's never been another like Rome. If you've ever studied Rome, Rome, it lasted for, depending on which scholar you're, you're reading, 800 to 1,000 years. It was incredible. 500 years of it was absolutely, in many ways, it looks almost miraculous. And when Rome fell, it fell, their government fell because of two main reasons. One is governmental instability. Jesus said, a house divided cannot stand. And so governmental instability. Many of the populations began to refute their government. And, 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 and as they continued to expand their territory, much of the territory would no longer adhere to the vision and the values and the mission of the Roman Empire. They were frustrated. They were subjects to the king and to this kingdom. The other thing, the weakening of their borders they, they quit paying attention to what was taking place, and they started losing ground and territory. Now, Jesus, here he is, in this first century, shows up on the scene. And he understands a couple of things about the Romans. Now, when we read about the Romans, we tend to think they were intellectual people. They really weren't. They were very barbaric in the beginning. When Rome overtook Greece, and they began to listen to the philosophers, and by the way, many of you have too. Socrates, Plato, um, Aristotle, all of those are Greek philosophers. And uh, well, I better not go down that road. But they began to, to take on a more educated approach, if you will, no longer quite as barbaric. And here's Jesus that comes on the scene. And Jesus, what he knows about these Romans is they've learned Greek. Greek. So Jesus speaks, and the reason I'm sharing this with you today is I want you to see that Jesus understood the culture of which and what he was, he was walking into when he began to make these declarations such as the kingdom of God is at hand. You see, where Jesus is is where his kingdom is. The Pharisees, the religious scribes, the Sadducees didn't recognize who God was in the form of Jesus when he stood in front of them. And yet the Romans didn't know either. And I'll show you why it's important. Jesus could minister right where he was and he could bring the kingdom within other kingdoms. You'll find out if you study how Christianity really expanded through missions, the missional work, whether it be the Apostle Paul or, or much later down the road, what you'll find out about missions is the Christian church really expanded through what's known as the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. The government of Rome, they made roads. They, they, Rome was considered to the ends of the earth. And I could show you the difference between even the Greek words that are used in the New Testament just to share and show Aeon is one of them, that, that in, in the Jews' perception of how big the world was, it was as big as Rome could go. Interesting that Jesus steps on the scene and there's another huge successful government there. And then the disciples come to Jesus and they say, teach us to pray. And what does Jesus say? Our Father, who art in heaven, 
Hallowed be thy name. It's, it's, it's almost like the first commandment. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. So the prayer is very similar. Hallowed be your name. God, you are holy. You are good. Your mercies endure forever. You, your thoughts are pure towards us. You are a holy God, and your governance needs to govern my life because you are the only one with pure intentions for me and for your kingdom here on this earth. And notice Jesus goes on to say, Hallowed be thy, thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is a kingdom here to be expressed. And that's where we come in with missions. It's not something we do. It's simply who we are, setting up his kingdom here on this earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, Lord, govern my life. You see, his kingdom has come and it has been reestablished on this earth. I understand the Roman kingdom and, and, and all of, of the things that Caesar was calling to rule and the fear of Caesars and the four Caesars. I've studied all of it. But, but one of the places I see is that Jesus is active in all, with all, to those who would surrender their will, their plan, their purpose for their life to his. Then they are on mission. A greater mission can happen. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, this is Simon uh, Peter, and, and, and you know the story here. He makes his confession on who Jesus is, and Jesus then responds and says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven, and I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Have you ever had a missionary come back from whether it be Africa or, or South America? They come back and they explain and they express to you these miracle signs and wonders, a youth group in Canyon uh, that I got to, to be a part of and, and to pastor for some time. The one that came in after me uh, took some kids to South America. They prayed over a man who was blind and he received sight. And they, they, they started calling me and saying, why didn't we see this in youth group? Why don't we see what happens over there here? Let me tell you why. Because we have corrupted God's government. And we think it's up for vote. And we think he needs our opinion on his creation. Instead of us surrendering to his way, his will, and his thoughts, which are pure towards us. So here we have Peter, and Jesus expresses a couple of things. And you may say, Curtis, why did you take us down the Greco-Roman road? The reason I did is for this, because what Jesus says here in the Greek, he brings up a couple of terms that, that are very, not, not necessarily foreign, but very familiar. They might be foreign to us, but they're familiar to the audience that he has. One of them is ecclesia. That is the church. It's the first time it's mentioned. I will build my church. Ecclesia is a Greek word defined as a called out assembly or congregation, uh, one built upon another. Peter, you are a rock. You are no longer a reed. You are a rock. You're, you are going to be planted in me. And because you surrender your will, your ways, and your opinion to mine, I am going to do something great with you. Peter gets to be in the upper room. He, he, he gets to experience the Holy Spirit falling upon them. Peter gets to stand up and preach the first message of the church. And he says, repent and let each one of you be baptized. John the Baptist, when he shows up, what's the first thing he says? Repent. And then Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, what does he say? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. This is where God leads us to repent is to surrender my will, my ways, my thoughts, my opinions to his and his governance in my life. And in doing so, church, we become ambassadors for Christ is what the Apostle Paul calls it. And now we are on mission. Whether it be in here or whether it be out there, it's not something we do. It's simply who we are. That's it. See, God's kingdom on earth. We have an imperative. No doubt he commands us to go, to go and do what? Make disciples. We'll get there here in a moment. To know God's word, to establish his government, to be equipped 
by the church for the purpose of our God is what and who we are all about. This is our mission. We are the called out ones, if you will. We are the ones who surrender our will, our ways, our opinions, our thoughts to God. That's known as repentance, to change our mind on these things, to have an understanding, not to look to take a vote on God and say, we like this part of your word, but we don't like this part. So this isn't for me. I don't even think that God, that you would act that way because you are a God of love. Well, you know, why people are so confused today because they don't have an understanding of love. Love tells the truth. It's not complicated. It's not something you just speak. It's something that you share and you show, but it doesn't encompass, it doesn't embrace every activity under heaven or heaven here on this earth. It surrenders itself to the one who created love, God himself, because God is love. And he's going to build his church. That's a promise. Isaiah reminds us that the government will be upon his shoulders. And so, look, if we don't walk with our God, our king, we don't know his words and his ways, we no longer belong to his government. We are no longer representatives, much less ambassadors of who and what he is. God is not a God of confusion. He is a God of order is what the word of God tells us. When we look to no longer surrender or submit to the will and word of God, we no longer submit and surrender to the will of his constitution, if you will, since we're talking about government. And then he goes on to say, and the gates of Hades will not overtake it. Now, there are three distinct words in Scripture in the Greek specifically used for hell. We have a lot of churches that no longer preach hell. We have a lot of churches that simply say this, that that hell is just the absence of God. Well, God is everywhere. He's omnipresent, if you want a big word for that. So what, what are those three words, and what is Jesus doing here in the Greek? It's interesting, the one he chose, but it will make all kinds of sense when I bring it before you this morning. First word for hell that we see really in the Old Testament, even in the Hebrew, is known as Sheol. And Sheol, I learned it at divinity school as a holding place. And, and, and from early times, from Job all the way through to Malachi, Job being the, the oldest known written uh, Old Testament book that we have, when you look at Sheol, you'll kind of see different things applied to it a holding place, a gray area. Some thought there may be a resurrection out of Sheol. Uh, Later on, it would be seen as as like a place of fire and those types of things. But that's one form of hell. Another form of hell is Gehenna. Now, Gehenna, a place outside of Jerusalem, poor, elderly, those who would beg for food, those who would be angry with life, those who thought they got an air unfair cut. How do we know that? Simply because of this, because of the gnashing of teeth. And so the gnashing of teeth is really anger. anger. So look, there is a place for those who will not surrender to Jesus and the hellfire that they're going to burn in, if you will, is going to be, that's not fair. I mean, the scripture says, that Jesus is the only way. Well, just because I believed in a different way or many different ways or always lead to the kingdom of heaven, that's not fair. Or I'm angry because I, I refuse to surrender and submit my will, my opinion, my thoughts towards God. And they burn in that. You ever, you ever seen anyone win and you know they didn't deserve to win and you kind of burn towards them? We'll just multiply that by, okay, you didn't get that. Trudy knows what it feels like. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry, Trudy. I, look, we just baptized somebody with a... I think if I saw right, Ben, you had a Texas Tech shirt on. I was going to say take him down twice. I'm just trying to wake y'all up. Bill, you got a response to that, don't you? Uh, so as we jump in, where was I? I don't even know. Gehenna. A place where there's gnashing of teeth. Anger. Burn with anger towards someone or something, and most importantly, towards God. But Jesus uses this Greek word, Hades. Now, Hades is, is, uh, in their day and time, this would have been a little bit of an unusual word, in the fact that it usually refers to the dead. 
and the gates of the dead will not overtake. Do you know why? Because he's the resurrection and the life. He knows exactly what he's talking about here, that his kingdom is eternal. And that's what he lays in front of the people So this is where we begin to really say, hey, Jesus is at hand. His kingdom is at hand. There should be an established government, a redemptive government. And it's a sign to Peter, which is is interesting to me. In other words, Peter has a responsibility to it. Jesus could have simply said, "Um, and, and you are the rock and left it there, or he could have said, and I will simply build my church, but he didn't. He combines the two because we are his redemptive plan for his government to come to this earth and to be upon this earth. He will build his church, no doubt, and he's called us to this mission. And here's the problem, just like Genesis, if we don't walk with our God, our King, if we don't know His Word, His ways, His will, we no longer belong to His government. Many churches have stepped away from the government of God. I could give you example after example. I could take you down a historical road starting from Stonegate in 1969 to where we are today with every Episcopal church and how a political action committee was formed and what was formed and what their three main intentions were for the Episcopal churches. And you may say, well, that's just the Episcopal church. No, that means a government of churches. The Episcopal church has one. Where one is, they're all linked and tied together. The Presbyterian would be another one. The Methodist would be a third Episcopacy type church, a governance of church. And if you could get it in one, you could take, you, you could get it through all of them. We have to protect what is sacred, what God has given to Peter. He has given to us in many ways. He's called us for this day for his plan and purpose. You are not a mistake. You are part of his kingdom principle, of his kingdom promise. And when we surrender our will to his, his government works through us. And when that happens, we become his witnesses throughout the world. That's mission. I just had seven pages. Okay, Jesus, on earth as it is in heaven, as the Apostle Paul reminds us, we are ambassadors for Christ, we're representatives of his government, so why don't we see over here what missionaries oftentimes see over there? When you are in mission or on mission or you are at another country, whatever it may be, you will find that you are under not the American government. You don't have the American protection. And many times what you have is simply your relationship with God. And you surrender your will, your ways, your thoughts are not your thoughts, and, and, and they become God's thoughts. And, and now you can say a prayer of purity because, God, I have nothing. I don't even have a hospital that I can take this person to. So I pray in the power of the Holy Spirit that they are healed in the name of Jesus, and others will give glory to your name, for you will shine as a city on a hill, and you will shine through me. That's mission, church. That's why we don't see it, because in the American church, we believe in in democratic government. It's one reason. Every government that is a government has a constitution. It has directives, values, vision. Every enemy of it will first ask the question, well, does it really say X, Y, and Z? Just like the enemy stated, the ambassadors or representatives are supposed to uphold the constitution it serves. They value it to demonstrate it. However, if you attempt to represent a kingdom outside of its said mission, then you are a deceiver because what you are to represent is the kingdom, but you don't even know the constitution. We would say it this way. You don't even know the holy scriptures that he's given us. And so we make them up. No, my God is this way. Well, that's your truth. This is my truth. You know what's beautiful about having the Bible? Is this not complicated? Look at how mankind complicates things. The scripture is is not calm. It's very cut and dry, sometimes too much for even me. I'm just like, oh God, why did you say it that way? I'm going to repent. So when we are commanded to go and make disciples, 
When we are commanded to go and do this, the way the Greek really translates this is because Jesus' interpretation, because of what Jesus has put before us, what Jesus has simply stated here. In the Greek, it doesn't read, go and make disciples. In the Greek, the, the true form of this scripture says, go and disciple them. Do you know why? Because his kingdom's already among us. For those who would surrender their will, their ways, and their opinion, the kingdom's already among us. So he has the expectation, go and disciple them. Go teach them my vision, my values, my will for their life so that they will have a fruitful life, so that they will have life and they'll have an everlasting life. They won't wind up in this place of eternal damnation or eternal death. We live for a holy and a pure God and church. His will and his ways are pure. His intentions are pure towards us. The world, many of it, much of it will try to pull us off our mission, off our surrendering. It offers a government far less than God's intention. Now, Jesus' government is here, but we must surrender to it first and foremost. And what God calls an abomination in Scripture is simply that. It's an abomination. The right to life clear in Scripture, for God is the God of life. Jesus is the only way. It's exclusive, yes, but He's the only one that gave His life out of His love for you. Even though while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that proves His love for us. Gender. There's only two. Today, our government identifies over 50, and in many job applications, over 80 today. There is a government that brings life and many others that bring death. But there is one God, Jesus is salvation, and his kingdom is here. And it is looked to be expressed through us. So missions is not what we do. It's simply who we are in God's government. Whether here, in here, or out there. You may ask the question, why do we plant churches? Well, We plant churches for this reason. They are a symbol and they are where the saints are equipped for service under God's governance, under his authority. That's why. That's why it's important. And now we're seeing them pop up over Africa. And some of us are saying Africa's getting walls up under Harvest Connection a lot quicker than we are here. That's called civil government. And I'll talk about that next week. But missions is not what we do. It's simply who we are. We are representative of God's kingdom, his will, his purpose, his government. It's simple. It's it's not complicated. Mankind complicates things, but Jesus doesn't. That's why he came. And he came, according to the Apostle Paul, at just the right time. And I wrote it somewhere in my notes, the scripture that I wanted to go to, to say those very words, and I don't know where I put it. But he came at just the appropriate time for his kingdom to be expressed and continue to be expressed through us, his church. For he says, I will build my church. So church, that's us. Mission is not something we do. Mission is simply who we are as we surrender, as we repent and surrender our lives to Jesus. Every one of you is created for his plan, for his purpose, for his kingdom to be expressed upon this earth. You are an ambassador for Jesus. Would you please stand? I'm going to ask if the altar team would make their way forward this morning. And if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, it starts there. Jesus reminds Nicodemus, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven, heaven on earth. And so for some of us, we just need to start that process. We saw a baptism today, a couple of baptisms that remind us what that process is to be born again, to be washed anew under the blood of the Lamb. I was praying last week with the intercessory prayer team, and Baba Fella said something. He doesn't even know he said it, because I know the Spirit was praying through him. But he said, to be immersed in your blood is what we so desire. I wrote it down. To be born again through the one king who gave his life up for his kingdom. And that is us. We would love to pray with you this morning. If you're online, uh, feel free to send a text over. Father God, thank you for this, your congregation. Thank you for your government. May we surrender ourselves to you 
your government first and foremost in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.